Hello, welcome to Awaken Your Creative Self. I am your host, Claudia Chan. I'm absolutely thrilled to bring on our guest expert today. He is widely regarded as America's foremost creativity coach. His creativity coaching focuses on helping creative and performing artists overcome creative blockage, performance anxiety, and handling criticism and rejection. He has written more than 50 books and has given lectures about creative life, mental health, and life's purpose and meaning. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Eric Mazel. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the show. I'm super honored to have you here with us today. Hi, Claudia. Lovely to be here. I think the first thing I'd like to ask you, Eric, is what does creativity mean to you and why do you think that it is important for people to tap into? It's a really hard question. Um, seems like there should be a simple answer as to what creativity means. In business, it's pretty straightforward. It means innovation or problem solving, but that's not what we mean by it. That's not what creative folks mean by it. I think the closest I can come is that it's about making use of our inner resources. We have all of these thoughts and feelings and talents and skills, and for some reason, we want to pull them all together and make things or say things or sing things. It's really hard to know where that impulse comes from. It's a little bit narcissistic in the sense that it means that we want to have our voice be heard. We want people to stop their daily affairs and look at us. So it's a little bit narcissistic, but it's also a reflection of humanistic values of our desire to save the world in a funny way. It's not that a poem or a song or anything we create really does save the world, but I think there's a sense in which we've put the world on our shoulders and we want to do something for the world. So that's a short answer to a very complicated question. Just yesterday, I was watching a documentary about uh, the painter Hockney, well-known painter who's now in his 80s and there's a documentary of him walking through um, a gallery of a retrospective of many of his paintings, sort of from, his, from the beginning of his career to his current paintings. And from my point of view, there was only one period where he was creative. Mm -hmm. And that's when he made his pool paintings, the famous blue Los Angeles paintings that everybody sort of knows and that fetch at auction tens of millions of dollars. So how could a creative person only be creative for five years out of 60 years? It's a really complicated question. So we're giving the short answer here about making use of our natural resources, but what's actually going on is, is very mysterious. I think what I'm hearing you is saying that it's in a way kind of identifying who we are as a person when it comes to creativity. Am I did I catch you there or? I think that's right. It is a self-identification. And those folks who sort of would like to be, quote, everyday creative, and, and there are way more people who want to be everyday creative rather than identify as a songwriter or a novelist, they tend to never be creative. Because without a domain, without working in a field, there isn't really a way to be creative. It's like being very intelligent, but not really thinking about anything. Mm -hmm. that, that it doesn't make much use of your intelligence. As soon as you give an intelligent person a problem, well, then they can engage their intelligence and become a problem solver. But if you don't self-identify as a problem solver, then you'll skip solving problems. So I agree that there's some self-identification going on that's very important. And I think it happens very early on. I think it happens when we're five or six or seven. I think we fall in love with a domain. Is that kid sitting in the corner reading a book? That's us. We fall in love with words or images or music. Sometimes it's forced upon us, those music lessons and what have you, those dance lessons. Sometimes it's forced upon us, but for all of us, there is a place of love where we fall in love early on. And then it makes sense that we would want to work in that territory. It makes sense that we would want to re-experience that love by making something ourselves that other people can love. So I guess if you've never fell in love with anything, maybe it's very hard to self-identify as a creative person mm -hmm. in a domain 
And that may be one of life's tragedies. If a person never does fall in love with something, then they're stuck not being in love their whole life. That's a very interesting concept that you talked about that, of course, we have to fall in love. But if you've never had that opportunity to fall in love with the creativity or um, something that you just happen to come across, what are some of the ways that people can get in touch with that again? Well, I believe in simple tactics. And one simple tactic is to make a, th- make a list of the things you now love to see if one of those is, is worth your devotion. If you can't make a list of anything you love at all, then we need to go back a step to the question of what's preventing you from loving. And that would be an interesting investigation for any particular person. I write in the um, authoritarians in the family area. I write Mm -hmm. a lot about authoritarians and, and bullying and childhood trauma and what have you. So I know that people are harmed in childhood The pundits who write in that area claim as many as 25% of the population is authoritarian by nature. So virtually everyone has had to deal with an authoritarian in his or her life. And that leads to lifelong wounding of the sort where maybe you've never been able to fall in love with something. So this is not what coaches do. I'm a coach. Coaches don't examine authoritarian wounding. It's an area for therapists. But on the other hand, Coaches have to be psychologically minded, and we have to ask the question, what's going on? We do have to ask that question. If a client can't get to her novel week in and week out, it's not really okay for us to say, I have no idea what's going on, or I have nothing, I have nothing to try. So then we have to go to questions like these psychologically minded questions like, what's getting in the way? Where are you hooked? What's the trouble? And so either you can answer the question yes, I can make a list of things I love and maybe identify something to throw myself into, or no, I can't make, I don't love anything. And then we have to dig deeper. One of the things that intrigued me, what you said was the authoritarian wounding, because it seems like a really harsh word. I mean, if you're just talking about parents, like what they said to you and what you actually believe them or uh, some of the times when they ask you to okay you need to go go through this this is and you're just following through and I think that's also part of the authoritarian wounding wouldn't you like is that what you mean sure there's actual abuse and there's lots of actual abuse actual physical abuse and emotional abuse and then there are the more subtle kinds of woundings where the parent somehow removes permission from you to succeed. Somehow you just don't have, nothing you do is ever quite good enough. And also, a certain kind of authoritarian wounding has to do with conventionality. Authoritarians are very conventional and they care what other people think and what other people see and how they look and they care how their kids look. Mm. And so it may be in some sense a loving family with good values and yet, when that layer of conventionality is imposed upon kids, then they know that they're supposed to get good grades and draw within the lines and succeed in a certain way and be a lawyer, not, not a dancer, and et cetera. And that's all authoritarian. And it's not necessarily like physical abuse or verbal abuse or emotional abuse. It's not like that, but it's still authoritarian. It's still the conveying of certain values that prevent the child from being his or her own person. And I totally agree with that, just because with the society being bringing up the kids, especially for myself anyways, with being Chinese and the way that we're brought up, um, it's a very linear approach versus um, like you get to try out different things real lives. And would you be able to touch on how that prevents us, like talk about like the limiting beliefs that we have and how can we overcome these negative thoughts? Well, what comes up for me is a sort of an anecdotal piece. I think it was Isaac Stern or some famous violinist who first, when he first went to China to play with a Chinese orchestra, remarked that they could play all the notes beautifully, but they weren't making music. Mm. And so that's one of the way that ways that, that this challenge manifests is that you, you, you may do a thing well, but never be, to use that word we've been talking about, never be creative. 
because you don't have permission to do your own thing. You don't have permission to be an individual. Many people don't have permission to be an individual. Those people who do have permission to be an individual will always butt heads against society. They'll always be oppositional because they don't want society to rule them and prevent them from manifesting their individuality. So there are two completely different problems. That one set, one set of people face the problem of being individual and another set of people face the problem of dealing with society's rejection of their individuality. So there's a lot going on there. There isn't one simple thing to say. I think ultimately I'm dealing more as a, as a coach and an author with folks who um, have gone down some conventional path and so struggle to break free of that conventionality and to use, use loose language, take risks. They have trouble taking risks. And a lot of the work I do with clients is inviting them to take risks, which translates as buying a lot of canvas and ruining it, or standing on a street corner and singing, or doing something that really feels uncomfortable, dash dangerous, dash risky, not for the sake of having an audience on a street corner, or not for the sake of ruining the canvas, but for the sake of having the experience of some freedom. There was a psychologist who existed at about the same time as Freud and Jung. His name was Otto Rank. And he was one of the few psychologists of that era who wrote about creative folks. And he coined the phrase artist manque, M-A-N-Q-U-E. And he said that was, a, that was a would-be artist who fled from the experience of freedom. And I think it's a brilliant concept. I, I think that there are millions and millions of would-be creative folks who, who continually flee from the experience of freedom just as many people flee from the experience of silence. They can barely tolerate silence. As soon as they walk in the house, they have to turn on the TV or talk radio or look at their phone or something, because there's something dangerous about being in contact with one's own mind. So it's a long-winded way of saying um, that's a particular kind of danger that is having freedom and not using it. Could you, since you were talking about taking risks, and um, or even just by you saying, go and try and stand at the corner to sing, and that already evoked something <laughs> inside of me, like right, like, and it probably evokes a lot of anxiety over people. How do you overcome that? Well, parenthetically, I'm sure you know that the world's number one phobia is public speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, we hate revealing ourselves. We hate showing ourselves. It turns out to be more difficult to give a two-minute speech at work than fly or deal with spiders or this or that. It, it's, it's the scariest thing for most people is public speaking. How do you deal with it? Well, you reframe it as anxiety, which it mm -hmm. is. It's not really a reframe. It's just accurately naming it. Mm -hmm. Name it as anxiety, and then you move to anxiety management. Mm. It's why I've done so much work in the area of anxiety management. I have a book out called Master and Creative Anxiety, and lots of my books deal with simple tactics for dealing with anxiety. Because unless a creative person understands the extent to which anxiety threads through the process, embraces that reality, and then learns some anxiety management tools that actually work, they're not going to create. And let me say a thing or two in addition to that, and that is you can't escape anxiety if you're a creative person. And, and there's, there are two or three primary reasons. One is you're going to face criticism, rejection, exposure, and all of those things when you show the work. You really are. And that provokes anxiety. Nobody wants to be criticized or rejected or laughed at or embarrassed or humiliated or any of those words. Nobody wants that. So that's coming. Your five-star reviews are coming, but so are your one-star reviews. They're coming. So you have to embrace that. You have to accept that that's coming. That's one source of anxiety. The second source of anxiety is that the creative process is, in fact, going into the unknown. It's not a make-believe unknown. It's a real unknown where you don't know what's going to happen. People don't like that. Mm -hmm. People want to know what's going to happen. And so they're much more likely to not bother with that encounter going into a real unknown and do something quite known like turning on an episode of a show they're watching or something. 
Mm. That's easier than going into the unknown. But the third is the most important, and this creative folks don't know at all or have a hard time understanding, and that is the creative process is, in fact, one choice after another. Put the comma in, take the comma out. Put some red here, put some blue there. Send your character to Paris, send your character to Zanzibar. You have to make these choices, and choosing provokes anxiety. So since the creative process is one choice after another, and since choosing provokes anxiety, the process by its nature provokes anxiety. Can't get around that. Mm -hmm. And so folks really have to acquire some smart, two or three, I would say, anxiety management strategies that actually work in the moment, that are portable. Doesn't matter if you're not anxious during your morning meditation practice, that's lovely, but that doesn't serve you when you get to your computer screen and you're trying to write your novel. So even if you're calm at some point in the day because you have a yoga practice or a meditation practice or an exercise practice or whatever it is you have, that's lovely, but that's not the same as having an anxiety management strategy that actually works when you're trying to get to your creative work. I see. Now, um, since you were talking about anxiety management tools, um, could you share maybe one with us that the audience could take away from right, right off the bat? Sure. Let me actually share three because they go together. Oh, okay. One is, one is deep breathing. Five seconds on the inhale, five seconds on the exhale. It's been known for thousands of years that some deep breathing reduces anxiety. It reduces it both physiologically, but also psychologically, because if you're engaging in deep breathing, that means that you're acknowledging that you're feeling anxious. Mm -hmm. And that's already a good first step. So there's deep breathing. Then there's good cognition. There's thinking thoughts that serve you. We create all kinds of dramas and we're tricky creatures and we sabotage ourselves all the time by what we say to ourselves. So one anxiety management tool is to think thoughts that serve us rather than thoughts that don't serve us. And then you can combine those two. You can drop a useful thought into a deep breath. I call those incantations to distinguish them for affir from affirmations. They're really affirmations in a breath where you just find some useful words like one I like is I'm completely stopping. I'm completely on the inhale, stopping on the exhale. I'm completely stopping mm -hmm. and breathe and think that a few times. And what that stands for is I'm completely stopping my need to get things right. Hmm. Because all day long, you and I and everyone else are supposed to get things right. Mm -hmm. That's our job in life, to get things right. Then some moment is supposed to come where we have real permission to make mistakes and messes. It's not easy to make that transition from spending all day long trying to get things right to then opening to this possibility of mistakes and messes. That's why this I'm completely stopping is such a useful ceremonial bridge from one's everyday mind, which is got to pick up the kids at three and get the lawn mowed and all that stuff, which is appropriate. The ceremonial bridge from that way of thinking to, wow, I can screw up as much as I want for the next half hour. Those, those tips that you talked about is really useful. Now, can you just um, briefly... Um, dive a little bit more into the positive thinking part because I think a lot of people have a lot of limiting self-belief. And how do we combat that? Because it's a very, it's a tricky one, as you said. It's a tricky one. How do we come across these thoughts and how do, how do we, no, we acknowledge to, these it's, thoughts? It's actually simple to say. It's not simple to do, but it's simple to say. Mm -hmm. We have to hear what we're saying which we don't like to do because we're tricky creatures and we're trying to avoid hearing what we're saying. And we have to hear, we have to understand what we're hearing. So if we're saying, what, what do people say the most nowadays? I'm too tired and I'm too busy. Mm. That's what they say to get out of getting their real work done. And since there are so many grains of truth to those utterances, we let ourselves off the hook. So we have to, when we hear I'm too busy, we have to know that we're tricking ourselves. We have to append a big but there. I'm busy, but I could spend 20 minutes on my novel. Mm -hmm. Or I'm, I'm tired, but I can you know, take a quick shower and get to my painting for half an hour. We have to put that but in there. I'm X, but I can still do my work. So it's about hearing and really hearing. Mm -hmm. Hearing our trickiness. 
It's also about remembering that true thoughts may not serve us. That a thought is true is not a reason to countenance it. For instance, let's say you walk into a bookstore and you look around and you say to yourself, wow, there are a lot of writers. That's a true thought that's not going to serve you if you're trying to write your novel. It's going to discourage you. It's going to defeat you without you even knowing that that thought just defeated you. Mm -hmm. So even true thoughts are not thoughts that serve us unless they do serve us. So step one is to hear what we're saying, including all those true thoughts. Step two is to dispute them, not about their veracity, not about whether they're true or false, but about whether they serve us or not. So that would sound like, wow, there are a lot of writers. No, that thought doesn't serve me. Mm. That's B. A is hearing, B is disputing. And C is then saying something affirmative, having a global affirmation. Could be something like, I'm getting back to my novel. Mm -hmm. So that whole inner interchange would sound like, wow, there are a lot of writers out there. No, that thought isn't serving me. Back to my novel. Mm -hmm. So it's a simple one, two, three, which most people are unwilling to engage with. It, it's hard to say why. It's, it's hard to say if people really are so engaged in fleeing from freedom that they won't really look at their own cognitions. Whatever the reason is, people instantly get what I'm saying, but that's not the same as then doing it. And I believe that just because I think we have so many thoughts coming in and out of our head every day it's a lot of brain power to actually catch yourself thinking that or even it's like whatever you see is like a very subconscious that it just goes into your head that you you don't notice that it's actually being processed as that thought that's right that's why i have to say a kind of a long sentence here um, I don't believe there is a purpose to life. I believe that we make life purpose choices. That is, mm -hmm. we decide what's important to us. Mm -hmm. Well, if we elevate this kind of thoughtful work to the place of life purpose, then suddenly we are more motivated to actually do this daily work of noticing our thoughts and disputing those that don't serve us. We have to ask of ourselves whether or not it's important to do this work. If it's not, then we won't do it. But of course, it is important enough. And so it should come before, it should, there should be a separate to-do list from our ordinary to-do list that involves our life purpose choices, the things that are most important to us. In fact, I invite clients to start each day with a life purpose check-in where they look at their list of life purposes, where they remind themselves what their menu looks like. And these will be normal things like creativity and relationships and service and activism and career. There are only about a dozen things that people find important. Mm -hmm. you know, and it'd be different for each person in terms of the rank order of things. And so you make your list of what's important to you, and then you try your darndest to actually get to them on a daily basis. Most people are pulled by the nose by their daily to-do list, which has nothing to do with their life purposes just their errands and duties and responsibilities and shoulds, all the shoulds that should happen today. If you can make this switch from starting your day with that to-do list to moving to this new life purposes to-do list, you've made a huge change in your life. Mm -hmm. And it leads nicely to what I would like to ask you about because I'm really inspired by your morning creativity practice. Because when you're working with the other artists, um, you actually encourage people to do that first thing in the morning. Could you um, talk more a little bit about that? Yeah, and you say encourage, I would say I demand it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's the primary strategic change to make for every creative person. Because if you try to wait to get to your work as the day progresses, you get both too tired and sad because you get sad because you haven't gotten to your real work on that day. So by the end of the day, you're a little depressed and very tired and you're not gonna to get to your work. So it's really mm -hmm. important to get to your creative work first thing. So there are three reasons why it's so important to get to your creative work first thing. First of all, that would amount to a daily practice and a daily practice is a wonderful thing and you would get a ton of work done over time. And if you don't have a daily practice, what happens is if you skip days 
If you don't write for three days, you lose months and years. That's what happens. You suddenly stop writing for the longest time. As Soon as we start skipping days, we lose long stretches of time. So that's why daily practice is so important. I have a new book coming out, actually comes out tomorrow. I'm not sure when this interview airs, but it comes out September 8th called The Power of Daily Practice, which is all about the importance of daily practice. So the first reason is this daily practice one. Without a daily practice, most creative folks won't get to their work at all. The second reason, and this is one that folks don't understand, and that is if you get to your creative work first thing, you get to make use of your sleep thinking. You get to make use of what your brain has been working on during the night. And the brain thinks while it sleeps. It also dreams. Since 1899, when Freud wrote The Interpretation of Dreams, we've paid too much attention to dreaming and not enough attention to the, to the thinking that the brain does at night. We dream in REM sleep, we think in non-REM sleep. If you wake a poet up in non-REM sleep, she's gonna be writing a poem. If you wake a mathematician up in non-REM sleep, she's gonna be solving a mathematician math, mathematical puzzle. Mm. You can invite your brain with a sleep thinking prompt the night before, you can invite your brain to work on your book, your song, whatever. That would sound like, I wonder what Mary would like to say to John in chapter three. It would sound like a wonder of a certain sort. You invite your brain to do that wondering and it will work hard all night long for you, having mm -hmm. conversations between Mary and John. And then when you wake up, you can just take dictation mm -hmm. because the conversation has already been created by your brain during the night. It is a shame to lose that hour and a half or two hours of creative time during the night by not turning your, to your creative work. The second you turn to the new day, the second you start to make decisions about should I have a bagel or bran flakes or what have you? You lose your sleep thinking. Mm -hmm. Say it differently, the second you awake, you lose your sleep thinking. You wanna to get to your creative work in a kind of dreamy way, half asleep. Mm -hmm. So that's the second reason is we're wasting all of our sleep thinking by not getting to our creative work first thing. It's a big waste. And then the third reason, as important as those two are, daily practice and sleep thinking, as important as those two are, I think the third is almost the most important. And that is by having done some real work first thing, we have the experience of having made some meaning on that day. And the rest of the day can be half meaningless and we won't get depressed. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an antidote or an inoculation against existential despair from which millions of people are suffering. Millions of people are suffering from not getting to their real work and not believing that they and their efforts matter. Mm. So that's a lot to ask from a simple tactic that you get to do it every day and you get to make use of your sleep thinking and that it works as an antidote to existential despair, but that's what a morning creativity practice will do for folks. I have to say that th this practice is very powerful when I was when I actually heard you mention that before and I'm like, yeah, this is definitely something that is going to change people's lives because it is something that you're doing continuously and it's a habit that you're developing and it's just going to move you forward. When, I, when you're working with the artists, I know that you have mentioned before, like honoring the creativity process. I want you to, to hear you speak a little bit more about that because i know as we're working through every day what are some of the challenges that people are coming out with and they're actually having to deal with people don't know it but they hate the creative process they would they would say they love it but here's what they hate they hate spending two years on a novel that doesn't work that's the creative process not everything works mm -hmm. creative folks don't want to hear that um, how many of Bob Dylan's thousands of songs are wonderful? 17, 26, 48. Some small percentage of the whole, only a percentage of what we do works. People want to, creative, would-be creative people want some guarantee that the thing they're about to launch into, embark upon, is going to be good. You can't have that guarantee. You can't have it because it's not the truth. Only a percentage of the things you do will work. So you have to show up and not attach to outcomes. And 
folks will get that at some point. If I say it enough times in enough different ways, a client will finally hear that they have to show up and not attach. But to begin with, they're too attached. They care too much. They don't get the right balance between, I'm holding my hands up here, you can't quite see it, but I'll raise my hands. <laughs> it, it's a balancing act between attachment and detachment. You, I'm not, I don't believe in complete detachment. I don't believe in being a depressed Buddhist. That's not what I'm after. I think attachment is fine. We want ambitions and desires and, and goals and, and dreams and all of that. We want that. But the second we come to the canvas or to our instrument or to the computer screen, we have to let go of all that ambitiousness and just do the work and not attach to the outcome. So it's a certain kind of dance, a certain kind of dynamic tension between attachment and detachment. Most folks are way too attached. That's where that perfectionism comes in, into play. Perfectionism is just another name for a certain kind of anxiety about making a mess. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to have permission to make that mess. You, you must find that place in yourself where that permission resides. If you can't find that place, you know, you'll, you'll, Write five words and remove seven words, which is a fam famous aphorism. You'll never get the thing done because you'll keep trying to polish that pearl rather than make the mess that's required. So that's just one piece of the process bit. And when I talk about honoring the process, this is what I mean. I mean, sticking out the fact that over time, you'll create, this is my hands again, over time, you'll create a body of work. This is your body of work. But there also will be tons of things off to the side that never did work, that never were good enough to be included in your body of work. And it's your body of work that you're after, not about everything that you've ever touched, because much of what you've touched will not be any good. When you talk about the perfectionism, that's that's me. <laughs> yeah. That's just because like it's all about being right and all about being what's the least least resistance to getting to where I want it to be, and that's something I struggle with a lot. And even mm -hmm. in my teaching, I'm very methodical, analytical, so that like it seems like it's the most direct route. And so when and when you're saying that you need to have that permission to. Um, to get messy. And I think that's a very important point that you touched on. And, you know, again, it's a dynamism. It makes perfect sense to deliver a good course, not make a mess of it. That makes perfect sense. But then when you're dreaming up the next course, that's when you want that blue sky capability of making a mess. So there are times when it makes perfect sense to do the appropriate thing, do the right thing, repeat yourself for the sake of saving time. All of that's appropriate when it's appropriate, but then there are the other times when it's completely necessary to make those messes and mistakes and to be, to be open to the, to the biggest possible stuff that's inside of us. Yeah, that is um, such a deep thought that I have to really process that one. And I think it's also important for people to realize this. And when you talk about um, transit, like, transitioning from life being very straightforward and you need to do things right to coming down to this process of sitting down to start creating. And it's just that transition that can be a little bit tricky. Right. And that's why I use that phrase ceremonial bridge. I, I think one needs a conscious tactic to move from one's everyday mind mm -hmm. to a creative space. It can be something simple. It can be, you know, ringing a bell doesn't have to be an elaborate, but you just want a marker. You, you want a marker into your creative time. And I think you also want a ceremonial bridge out. I think it's really useful to know that you've stopped working on your novel and that you've returned to the rest of the day at a certain point, because you want to then be present for your other life purposes, your mm -hmm. children, whatever else is in life. You don't want to be still with the creative thing when you have other responsibilities and duties. Most creative folks don't get to their work often enough. Then there's that small percentage of creative folks who can't leave their creative work, the Picassos, who have trouble actually living a life because they're obsessed with doing the next canvas and the next canvas and the next canvas. That's its own problem and its own challenge. 
And that's why I think pointedly ending your creative session each day has some power and some practicality so that you know that you're entering the rest of your life. And that's very good because um, I think between getting the ceremonial um, marker in and then starting your creative process and then ending it, and it make, you make a habit out of it enough that it's going to bring you forward, going through all the challenges that you, that you encounter. And I think that's one big piece that a lot of us are missing. And I think that's a very good tip. And let me, let me piggyback on that. Um, just as I don't believe that there's a purpose to life, but rather our life purpose choices, mm -hmm. I don't believe that there is a meaning to life. I believe that meaning is a certain kind of psychological experience. It's an unusual mm -hmm. one, but it's only a psychological experience, which means that it's going to come and go. Meaning's going to come and the meaningfulness of X is going to come and go just as every experience, just as joy comes and goes or anger comes and goes. Meaning comes and goes. People don't understand this. And they also don't understand that something that we do in the service of meaning, like writing our novel, may not feel meaningful in the doing. This is a super big point. Because we expect, until we think about it, we expect that something that we say is meaningful ought to feel meaningful. But for those 300 days you're writing your novel, on 280 of those days it may not feel meaningful at all. It may just feel like sloggy drudgery. That has to be okay. We have to get a mature understanding of meaning to understand that all of those sloggy days are in the service of meaning, but we may only get the experience of meaning for seven seconds at the end of that year. Mm. Some brief moment of going, wow, that was meaningful. That's a lot of work for seven seconds of meaning. People really do not understand this. They, they expect that if they show up, it should feel meaningful. Look, I showed up. Why isn't it feeling better? <laughs> that takes a very mature mind to understand this point. It does. And I think one of the things leading into this question, I think it's a question for myself. I think I start a lot of things, but I don't complete a lot of things. And I think you just answered why it is. <laughs> that characteristic problem. That, that's right. So many clients start things and they quote, they're bored by it, or the, Virginia Woolf said resignation sets in. They don't, this is about not understanding the process. And so, not, understand how, not understanding how meaning works. We, we have never been trained accurately in how meaning works. And the, what I'm saying is actually a new position on meaning. And people get it, but they never hear it anywhere else <laughs> so okay tell us <laughs> how do we overcome this i think for myself that's one of my biggest <laughs> biggest obstacle <laughs> life pur your life purposes have to be held as more important than your experiences of meaning that is that something does not feel meaningful to you is irrelevant if this is in fact one of your life purposes. It's to let go of caring about whether or not meaning exists or there is meaning in your life. Because meaning is in fact a wellspring and a renewable resource in the sense that any emotion is, any psychological experience is, you can have it again. So it's a beautiful thing, but it comes and goes, and it's not the thing to be focusing your attention on. If you're caught up in this language, for 2,000 years we've been caught up in this language of, should I go to the top of the mountain to find meaning? Should I sit at some guru's feet to find meaning? Is there meaning in some philosophy or religion? There's not meaning anywhere. It's a psychological experience inside mm -hmm. of us which can be coaxed into existence. This is a very long subject. Meaning can be coaxed into existence by seizing meaning opportunities and by making meaning investments. This is my language around meaning, and there's too much to say in this shorthand, in this short amount of time. But the headline is, stop caring so much about how the experience is feeling, whether or not it's feeling meaningful or not. Remember why you're doing it, and remember that you are likely to get an experience of meaning from this, albeit a brief one. Mm -hmm. This idea that meaning should be with us as a continuous whatever, understanding 
something that we lost it, we lost our purse, we lost our wallet, then we have to retrieve it somewhere. It's not about lost or found. It's just about it being a certain kind of experience that's mm -hmm. bound to come and go. Mm -hmm. That's definitely something that um, you have to consider. And when you talk about like um, finding your why, and it's always about coming back to why you're doing this and whether yep. what the what the outcome is you have to remove yep. yourself from there and i think those are very important points that yeah and, the, and, the, and the the meaning of a th the meaning of this the same thing shifts over time things do not retain their meaning what kind of example let's say you love to collect antique posters mm -hmm. that's meaningful to you for some reason something you enjoy doing but then your wife dies of cancer and suddenly your hobby is completely meaningless to you. Mm -hmm. Just no longer is meaningful. We could make the, we could tease out the connection of why it suddenly lost its meaning, but that's what happens. Or to take another example, let's say your health is very meaningful to you, mm -hmm. but then your child comes to you and needs a kidney because she has some disease. Mm -hmm. Well, suddenly the meaningfulness of your health recedes and the meaningfulness of donating your kidney ascends. Mm -hmm. Meaning shift. It's, meaning is contextual. Mm -hmm. Reading the same book in 1983 and 1993, you're going to have a different experience of the meaningfulness of that book. The book didn't change. We have changed in those 10 years. So that's a lot to say about meaning, but the main thing is that we have to stop searching for it. We have this metaphor for thousands of years of searching for meaning, seeking meaning. We have to let that go and change it to making meaning. Mm -hmm. It's the paradigm shift from seeking meaning to making meaning. That is a very powerful thing to say for making meaning. And I totally agree with you because the meaning can change really based on your life events, what you're doing, what happens to you. And um, definitely, and also even just tiny moments in life, or even like with me, like with a three year old, when you, I'm just laughing with him, right? That's a meaningful to me. So, or holding, holding a child's hand crossing the street. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Exactly. You know, that's what's meaningful. Mm -hmm. And we could we could tease apart why it's meaningful, but that doesn't not important to tease it apart. Exactly. And sometimes if the person's stuck here, I'll have them actually make a list of those experiences that have felt meaningful, that have actually felt meaningful, as opposed to those experiences that were supposed to feel meaningful. And on the list of supposed to will be things like your PhD program didn't feel meaningful at all. Whereas maybe talking to your Aunt Rose about the family because she had all the secrets, that was really meaningful. Mm -hmm. That kind of that kind of difference. If you were, if people would actually make a list of those things they experienced as meaningful versus those things that were supposed to feel meaningful, well, then they would understand where meaning resides in that first list. Mm -hmm. And it would be small things like holding your child. Be like, it would be wise to take the day off and be with your child rather than work on your dissertation because that's actually where yes, you've got to get it done and all of that. But still, that's, that's the day that's going to feel meaningful. Going to the zoo is the day that's going to feel meaningful, not the day working on your dissertation. Exactly, exactly. Um, before we wrap up, um, Eric, I know that you work closely with creatives and artists. Would you mind sharing with us what type of artists do you work with and what are some of the benefits of working with a creativity coach? Well, all artists in every domain, um, actors, playwrights, filmmakers, writers, painters, and also anybody who works in a, in, in, a, in a discipline that requires their creativity or their manifesting their intelligence. I work with lots of academics, uh, software engineers, anybody who needs to get some real work done. What are the benefits? Well, that connects to what are the presenting issues. The presenting issues are usually, I'm not getting my work done, so the benefit is getting your work done. I don't know how to make a go of it. I don't know how to be a success. Marketplace issues. So then the benefit is learning how to better negotiate and, and navigate the marketplace. And I'm not, I'm getting my work done, but I'm not liking it. And I'm not feeling good in general. So then it becomes being a rather, rather like a life coach for creatives, all kinds of life coach issues 
around emotional well-being and anxiety management and addiction recovery and all the things we've been talking about. I think coaches are completely allowed to work with psychologically minded issues because if they don't work with those issues, they can't really help the creatives in front of them. So uh, for people who are interested in working with um, you, where can they find you, Eric? Well, my website is myname.com, ericmazel.com, E-R-I-C-M-A-I-S-E-L.com. And you can always drop me an email to ericmazel at hotmail.com. Perfect. And Dr. Maisel has written so many books and on creativity and life, meaning of life, and um, even mental health issues, because all of these are re- related to our lives. And um, definitely check, uh, check his book out. So Eric, I would like to thank you so much for taking a time to come on this interview. I had such a pleasure speaking with you. Great being here. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much. Bye.